I'm 38 years old. I'm not married. I have no children, and there are more gray hairs in my head than I'd like to admit. Within my family group, I serve as a son, a brother, and an uncle. Within the SLS community, I serve as a science teacher, a colleague, an advisor, a dean, and a coach. In my church community, I serve as a member and a youth leader. And within my friend group, I hope that I serve as a confidant, a jokester, a shoulder of support, and someone that you can be trusted. When I was in ninth grade, my honors English teacher, Mrs. Irene Thomas, assigned the class to write a letter to our 35-year-old selves. And the letter was to contain information about who and what we aspired to be in the future. And years later, after graduating high school and college, I received the letter in the mail. And in it, I had written that I was a wealthy pediatrician with my own practice, happily married, I'm sure she was quite attractive, with kids, and I was able to take exotic vacations to the beach. Well, my true reality is drastically different to the one that I had predicted. And each reality is driven by a different set of goods within which my identity could be found. As a ninth grader, I envisioned that future me to be defined by external goods, Money, respect, maybe a little bit of jealousy from my friends. The future me was definitely driven by the allure of receiving external rewards for my hard work, which would maximize my importance and define who I would be. As a freshman, I was definitely thinking of external goods. I wanted those straight A's. I needed to get, the, I needed to get every answer right. I wanted my friends, the teachers, and my parents to just be in awe of me. As a 38-year-old man, I realize that my efforts have not brought me these external goods. And upon deeper introspection, I can see that it is much more important to focus on the value of the internal goods, like confidence, self-worth, rather than the external ones. I didn't become a teacher to gain wealth. Very few of us do. I get no compensation for serving others. I take no donations um, when I run the student ministry. And I don't get paid to spend quality time with my friends and family. But what's interesting to me is that in both these realities, independent of the associated goods, 95% of my time would really be spent serving and leading others. Now, leadership means a lot of things. It means to engage enthusiastically, so check. Serve skillfully, I think so, check. And strategically coordinate with others in order to help move a group or community forward in its mission. Check. Communities are made of many individuals, each of which are meant to lead in their own unique way based on their character and, val and virtues. Look, leadership is not reserved for the best looking, the most popular, the most outgoing, the most extroverted, the most athletic, the most knowledgeable. Leadership really is meant for everyone. And each group where leadership occurs has what is known as its ethos, this characteristic spirit of a culture or community as manifested in its beliefs and aspirations. Imagine an ethos as a place where community habits are conducive to everyone, every single member, thriving and acting as a leader that can cater to a specific need of the group. Throughout your lives, you will become members of many communities. Some will be short-term, others will require lifelong commitments. But inherent with membership in that shared collective worth is the duty to lead by effecting positive change within that group. This requires different characteristics. We embody these, and they are shaped by the virtues we develop through our life experiences. Well, until recently, I had always considered myself as an effective leader in my family, at my church, and here at St. Luke's. However, over the past year, I've encountered some character checkpoints and uh, emotional self-assessments that really had me question 
my own perception and understanding of leadership, both when I was a freshman and now as a freshman dean. Since ninth grade, I've been loud, enthusiastic, and passionate. You're most likely going to hear me before you see me. My excitement and emotions, when they are attached to like a cool science concept or a life principle or personal belief, can act as a megaphone for my already booming voice. Last year, I learned that when I teach, some students interpret this passion and enthusiasm as being mean and terrifying. Last year, I learned that when I preach, some church members may have interpreted my emotions as being too aggressive, even angry. Last year, I also learned that during meetings here, that my excitement and concern may have been received or heard as yelling. And last month, I learned that after years of judging and instructing my family on how to live better lives, nothing I said could stop the next heart attack from occurring. Instead, my emotions manifesting as anger evolved into the worst argument I have ever had with my mother in the midst of my sister's heart attack. Four different communities, four different audiences, delivering to me the same feedback. Well, shocked, disappointed, I began questioning everything. Was I really a leader effecting positive change? Were my emotions overshadowing my character and preventing these groups from, I don't know, moving forward? Was I destroying each community's ethos? Were people unable to thrive in my presence? Had my personality morphed an ability to an inability? Was I instead successfully misleading my whole life? You know, the only character education I really had in high school was discussing Pip or Miss Havisham in that honors ninth grade English class. But thankfully here at St. Luke's, we are intentional about character and leadership education. For both faculty and students, it's available. And I was fortunate enough this summer to participate in the Ethical Leadership Workshop here at St. Luke's and the Island School Teacher Conference on a Luther um, uh, Island in the Bahamas. The powerful combination was the most important immersive experience of my decade-long teaching career. The Island School has a vision of leadership effecting change. As part of the program, they used this Bahamian tribal term to recognize le leadership. The term was called cacique. Caciques were the chosen leaders based on their character, leadership, and commitment to the ethos of the community. At the end of my first day, I was shocked, surprised, honored, and truly humbled to have been named as a cacique. So in my day as a cacique, I met a woman named Corrine. We had to accomplish three major physical tasks this day. It was riding a bike, kayaking, and scuba diving. And I'm well within my comfort zone. I know how to do these things. But Kareen, who is older than me, has never ridden a bicycle nor been scuba diving. Well, a few bumps, a few scrapes, some wide-eyed expressions from Kareen. But she eventually rode that flat-tired bicycle to our dive location. And experienced divers were paired with inexperienced divers, and Corrine became my dive partner. She was demonstrably uncomfortable and seemed to be stretched well out of her comfort zone, through her stretch zone, and nearing the edge of her panic zone. When we received our cue to descend, Corrine reached out and didn't let go. When she grabbed my hand underwater, without fear or hesitation, I knew that she was, in fact, the cacique that day. In that simple moment, when a woman I didn't know demonstrated unconditional trust, and she showed me how to lead her through this terrifying yet awesome experience. The next day, 
I passed my Kasik duties on to Kareen. You know, a true leader doesn't just know how to lead, but knows how to be led. Having a title like Kasik doesn't mean that your leadership is more important than anyone else's. So I have a challenge for us this morning. And it begins by closing your eyes in your seats. With your mind and emotions, try to erase the labels and titles that you have been given or think that you deserve. Imagine that there are no freshmen, sophomore, junior, or seniors. No one is terrible or perfect at math, science, history. There are no captains, no star athletes, no bench warmers. There are no lead or supportive roles and no solos or ensembles. Instead, there are people, leaders. There are no heads of school. There are no department chairs, no deans, no administrators. There are no loud teachers, good teachers, bad teachers, terrifying teachers. Instead, there are people, leaders. Each of us is an individual with unique character and the ability to lead. We are each responsible for contributing and forming our collective upper school ethos. Please, open your eyes. But try not to stay blind, or try to stay blind to those labels. Our real challenge is to see the true character in each other and learn to rely on one another to lead our community towards our common goals. That real 35-year-old me that I wrote about so many years ago joined this upper school community and truly began to learn how to lead. So, what would you write to your 35-year-old self? Would it reflect a leader driven by external goods or one driven by character, virtues, and the desire to serve? Take every opportunity here at St. Luke's to learn how to lead. It will help you serve the world and positively affect change. Thank you.